Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to be, I'll read you the title, which is a long and complex title, and then I'll, I'll give a little intro on what the topic of this uh, presentation is. So, an ecology of AIDS infrastructures, a socio-technical history of the present. So what does that mean? Um, in this talk, I'm going to be traversing the history of AIDS, HIV AIDS, through its research infrastructures. So organizations that have supported science on HIV AIDS. I'm going to start by uh, beginning in 1983 with a project called the MAX, um, the Multicenter AIDS Cohort Study. And then I'm halfway through the chat, I'm going to switch and start talking about the WISE, the Women's Inter Interagency HIV Study. And then I'm going to conclude or bring it to pretty close to the present with the NA Accord. So I'm saying this is a history of the present. Um, particularly, this is not a history where I'm talking about things that once existed and do not exist anymore. I'm, talking, uh, I'm going to be telling a story that brings us to the present, where each one of these projects is still ongoing, and each one of these projects is actually influencing the next project as they move along in the narrative. Um, I'm also traversing sort of the history of my own research right now. I started and still continue to study the Max. Um, I'm currently uh, sort of in the middle of studying the Ys, and I've just begun my studies at NA Accord. So it represents the trajectory of the research that I'm undergoing this year as I've been at CITP. Um, this is a central analytic object. You don't need to understand this right away. I'm going to decompose it for you as I go along in the talk. But the, the kernel of a research infrastructure is something that I keep coming back to again and again throughout the three different projects. And I'll explain to you what this you know, sort of analytical contraption means as I go along. Um, for, the, for, the, for the technically oriented in, in the class, or even those not, the inspiration for this concept um, is the kernel of an operating system. So it is a, a loose metaphor or analogy with the kernel. Just for those of you who don't understand what that is, um, the kernel of an operating system is the part of an operating system in a computer that manages the devices, say things like memory or the CPU or devices. And sort of the key feature of the kernel is that it, it renders most of the operations of the, of the machine invisible to you. You don't need to understand how memory works in the computer because the kernel does a lot of the managing of that activity. It's relatively opaque or below uh, an abstraction layer uh, for an average user or programmer. So similarly, I'm going to do a similar kind of analysis about these infrastructures, um, their kernels. And then, so what is my overarching argument in this talk? What is this research about? Uh, I'm interested in exploring the ways that infrastructures are inscribed with their histories. Um, so the ways in which the histories of these projects carry with them across time, even as they uh, uh, surmount and, and adapt to different kinds of transformations or changes. So as we develop new ways to support science, so new research infrastructures, these often go under the header of these three terminologies today in the US and in Europe, e-science, cyber infrastructure, or increasingly we're calling them big data. As we develop new ways to support science, we are building upon the past rather than clearing it. So this is my, this sort of my, 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 my argument that I'm making against a lot of the efforts that I see going on in policy circles today, uh, or cyber infrastructure building projects today, where there's this idea of clearing the past and starting anew, creating an entirely new infrastructure. I'm going to have a different vision of how I've seen that operates within my own research. So let's dig in right away to the first case. This is uh, the logo from the MAX, or the Multicenter AIDS Cohort Study. Uh, what is the MAX? Then let me give you a little explanation. So it's a multicenter epidemiological study founded in 1983. So it's a, a, a team of scientists, mostly epidemiologists, but you'll see many other kinds of scientists participate as well, who are distributed across the nation. They're in four different cities, and they've been doing this, they've been participating in this project called the MAX since 1983. So just over 30 years now, almost 32 years now. Um, the goal of this organization is to investigate AIDS, and it was founded especially because in 1983 it was founded to investigate the cause. So importantly for this story, it was founded before we knew what the cause of AIDS was. The way they do so is by tracking cohorts of gay and bisexual men over time. So, uh, so 5,000 men were recruited in 1983, and they've tracked the health and activities of these men for the 30 years thereafter, occasionally recruiting further cohorts over time. 
Um, and they do so by collecting data and specimens. So for ev every six months, these 5,000 men or additional cohorts have come into the clinics and filled in a whole new set of questionnaires and donated blood and specimens for those 30 years. So uh, now, about, for those who've been doing it the whole time, over 60 times, they've come to uh, do this routine visit. And it continues in the present. This is important, right? It's not a, just a historical artifact. It's something that still is ongoing today. So for those of you who, who don't have an immediate sense of, uh, of, of the history of, of HIV AIDS, I'm going to give you a very quick potted history. If there's any historians here, this is a very much a potted history, right? It's, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump over 30 years in five, in five quick steps. Um, but this will give you a sense of the trajectory of these research infrastructures. So it was in 1981 that we uh, usually say that we recognized the phenomenon of AIDS. Um, in 1981, uh, a small group of doctors identified a small group of homosexual men um, in uh, Los Angeles with uh, a set of s symptoms that they couldn't quite explain, a, a, an immune deficiency, a decline in their immune systems that they didn't understand. And a couple of years later, it was called AIDS. Um, the MAX then was founded in 1983, so a couple of years later we have sort of a building arc of the sense of an epidemic appearing between 1991 and 1983. Um, more and more attention and the numbers are growing very rapidly in that time. So the MAX was founded in 1983 as this cohort study, a very large study for the period of uh, which it was started. Um, again, it wasn't until 1984 that we discovered that HIV is the cause of AIDS. So the MAX pre-exists this understanding of cause and the MAX was there partially to understand, to try to investigate where was this coming from? Why is this, ta why is this hitting one particular demographic so heavily and some other demographics less heavily as well? well? All these questions were sort of up in the air. They didn't understand, right? So it's an investigation, it's research. Um, I'm going to jump a vast history of the story of HIV AIDS and just jump till 1995. This is when we developed the effective treatment um, sometimes colloquially known as the cocktail, but more formally known as heart or highly effective antiretroviral therapy. This is a transition phase. Between 1981 and 1995, HIV-AIDS was fatal. It would, it would do so over a long period of time, but it, essentially it was inevitable. Very, very few people were left out of, of um, the, the, the rather morbid and painful death that accompanies uh, the decline of the immune system with AIDS. Um, 1995 then was when we developed the cocktail. At this point in time, it becomes a chronic disease. So as of 1995, for people who do have access to the cocktail, which is obviously not everyone in the world, and it's not always effective for everyone, but for those who it is effective for, and for those who have access to the treatment, it becomes a chronic illness. And so after that, you are living with HIV instead of dying from AIDS. Um, the MAX has continued though, and it still continues to this day. And so today they study things like aging with HIV. Starting around 2008, they became interested in this concept. The same, some of the same men right from the beginning or other men who joined the study over time, they still can, there's still open questions. It has not been cured and we don't have a vaccine and people who are HIV positive still have to live with it and there's new kinds of consequences that emerge about taking the treatment over time or in combination with aging, for example. So it's never sort of a closed research question. Okay, so the way that the MAX defines itself is saying they've transitioned from uh, a study of the natural history of AIDS to a treated history of HIV. This is the vocabulary that they self-identify with. So what do they do? What happened in 1983 that, uh, what's interesting for me as a, as a scholar of research infrastructure, this is an organization that has survived 30 years. Across all of these dramatic transformations that you see in many, many more, again, this is a very potted history, across all these transformations, this one research infrastructure has been able to adapt and continue to support the science over those years. So what did they do? What's my explanation? What did they do in 1983 when they founded the MAX that created an organization that was so flexible and able to support science over time? So this is where we get to this idea of the kernel. I'm going to describe it piece by piece to you as four different resources that they've sustained across those 32 years now. Things that they have tried to provide to the scientific community for the last 30 years so that they can keep doing their science. So firstly, they, they were founded with a, a, a large um, uh, group of heterogeneous scientific experts. 
So they didn't know what the cause of this thing was, right? So they, didn't, they couldn't say, oh, well, we'll definitely grab one kind of scientist or doctor, and that will be the specialization that's relevant. They had to have a heterogeneous contingent of scientists and doctors focused on everything from epidemiology. Um, uh, they had people doing behavioral studies, sexuality studies. They had virologists, immunologists. Um, cancer specialists because AIDS was initially associated with cancer as well and many other kinds of experts that they assembled as a team who could heterogeneously approach this question. Um, I mentioned that they recruited 5,000 men right from the beginning. Um, so 5,000 gay and bisexual men in four American cities um, and those men have come in and once every six months um, and they keep them. So it's, this, the, it's a cohort in the sense that you're tracking the same population over long periods of time. You don't sort of just switch from one group to another. You have to track them longitudinally and produce what I'm going to show you, the next two steps, the data over long periods of time, producing a, a longitudinal vision of, of the natural history of AIDS. So the third thing that they've um, maintained over those 30 years are uh, a set of standardized instruments. When I, when I say instruments, I sometimes mean biomedical instruments, things like assays, um, tests for uh, uh, white blood cell counts, and so on, but also questionnaires. So they've been asking them exactly the same questions, some modifications here and there over the years, but essentially the same set of questions for the last 30 years. Um, and they work to keep those the same, so that every time they, those men come in every six months, they ask them the same set of questions. And then lastly, what this produces is an archive, a vast archive of data and specimens. So they keep those data that they've been collecting for the last 30 years and try to make those accessible to new teams of scientists who come along. Also specimens. I'm not going to be talking too much about the specimens, but they've been collecting blood, <coughs> but also all kinds of other bodily materials right from the beginning. Right, so you can, I'm not going to get too detailed. Some of the charts will show you later what kinds of materials they've been collecting. But there's, um, they've also been collecting bodily materials and freezing those. So making those available to scientists over time. So this is what I call the kernel of a research infrastructure. Again, the metaphor is coming from computation. But really, don't, don't sort of focus on that too much. Really, the idea is that everything that happens below this line is largely invisible to the people who re rely on these resources. I'll give you an example in a second of my own experience working with the Max, but uh, you, you'll get the sense that all this activity that's going on of keeping the men coming back, of collecting the, the data and, and blood specimens, of asking them the questions, of having clinics and so on, is largely, is largely managed as a matter of the infrastructure, not something that the people who rely on these resources know a whole lot about. Um, and so then now you've got the full arc of the, of the kernel. So all of these resources are in the service of studying HIV AIDS over time. Yes? So just to clarify, you're using the term infrastructure, I mean, I know highly theorized and so forth, but um, do you use that instead of something like system or project and a, and a tr so we might say database? Sure. What, what is it that allows, it feels right, but, but did you use that term deliberately or did you just kind of fall into it? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, I mean, both. <laughs> I definitely fell into a tradition of infrastructure studies. Um, I'll give you an example in just a moment that will give you a sense of why think about this as an infrastructure rather than as a database, for example, or as a, um, what are the other ones, a system. Sure, sure. Um, and the key to that is that these resources are provided in support of the activity that you see on the top. So it's, it supports, it's infrastructure in the sense that it supports the doing of the science. So I'll, get, I'll, I'll display that in a second with an example. Um, let's jump ahead then. Um, I want to also focus, uh, draw your attention. This also sort of uh, answers your question. These, I, haven't draw, I haven't drawn a lot of attention to these four activities that accompany each one of the resources. But it's really crucial for understanding how this thing operates. So each time that there's a resource, it's coupled, as you can see, to an activity that maintains its avail availability over time. So diverse experts need to be coordinated. It isn't simply that they're you know, members and nobody has to do anything. They have to be constantly contacted and made visible to the people who might be wanting to access the, the, the expertise of these experts. Similarly, the data and specimen archives have been worked over those 30 years. I'll give you an example. Let's dig in 
actually, so here's one sort of technical terminology in the field is calling this human infrastructure. This is a, um, a terminology developed by Charlotte Lee and her collaborators. To all the activity that's going on in this layer is the constant work of a whole other set of experts who are not medical or doctors or, or the epidemiologists that I described earlier, but are other kinds of more technically oriented experts like database managers, like project managers, like, uh, like coordination experts, the kinds of doctors who ensure that the men come back every six months, who is a different kind of specialization than a medical expertise, but they are doctors who do this work of calling them and saying, come in again, we still need you, throwing them parties to say thank you for coming for those uh, 30 years. 60-something uh, times in their life for those men who've been doing it that long. Um, and there's an entire cadre of experts who work on calibrating the instruments to make sure that they're measuring the same thing time after time. I'm just going to dig in. Another way of describing that is, is heterogeneous engineering. This is a term by John Law. Um, it isn't one kind of engineering that's needed to, uh, the data and specimens might be a data manager, one kind of expertise. But that's a completely different kind of expertise and it's what's, what's needed to retain the subject cohorts over time. So different kinds of experts are needed to keep this operation running over time. But again, let's dig into two and give you just a little sense of what I actually mean then. So uh, the method that I use is I'm an ethnographer. Um, I go to these sites and actually uh, hang out and go attend meetings, um, interview the participants, um, and go visit the actual sites. This is a picture of the data management center. For any of you who think that data management centers might look like some sort of vision of Tron, um, where it's just like a, a series of really nice um, and, and clean looking uh, servers, that is not the case almost ever. A data management center tends to look like this, especially when it's been built up over 30 years. And you can see the history of the data management center in this image itself, right? So this is actually taken last year. This is not some historical image. This is, this is the live data management center. So you'll see uh, disks, uh, zip drives, CDs, the, the sticky tabs, and all of those binders are the correspondence um, that went on between the scientists, the, the, the organizers of the Macs, for the last 25 years, and then they switched over to doing it digitally. Right? So initially they were archived as paper. This project has also pushed me into being a bit of a historian, um, so not just sort of live and asking people live questions, but because it's a 30-year-old project, I had to go back into the archives, and those are my data sources right there. Right there is uh, usually these kinds of projects, these kinds of research infrastructures maintain an enormous record of their own activities, constantly monitoring their own activities. So that became my data as well. Just some different angles on the data management center, right? So lots of paper, CDs, like little stamps that they use. Um, so what I want to give you a sense of, that this organization, this line here that I've drawn, it, pr it provides an understanding of the scientific transformations that it's gone through over the last 30 years. But it's also gone through transformations in, it, in the way it does its collaboration, communication, and data uh, activities. So let's traverse those really quickly. It was founded on the technologies of phone, telex, and 8-track and tapes. The data was initially stored on these 8-track tapes. Right? Um, during the mid-1980s, they switched over to disk. This was a great revolution for them. They thought it was wonderful not to have to deal with these tapes anymore. Um, over the 90s, they started developing, the draw picking up the new tools um, that were coming out. So email was something they picked up in the early 90s. Uh, relational databases starting to share their data on CDs instead. Um, eventually, during the mid-90s, they, they, they went onto the internet and started putting their data onto web services. And today, um, and today they, they're using the cloud. Uh, so, but I don't want to give you a sense that they're sort of traversing this history and leaving it behind. This, this image, should, you should remember then, that, you know, all of the history of the ways in which they've collected data remain with them. Some of the data which they collected in the 1980s never made it from a CD or from a, 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 a disk onto another data format, right? And so they still keep those, maybe planning on coming back eventually and digitizing them in a new way. But you know, it's always sort of an ongoing process to do so. So the history is inscribed in their own formats. Here's uh, one of my favorite images that I always like to show. This is the data transmission form. Um, this is the form that they, they implemented in 1987 in order to, um, uh, anytime that somebody wanted data from them, 
they would fill out this form and then mail it along with the, the actual data in whatever format they were using. And you can see here that you, know, you can check which, which kind of media you're using for the data, a 3.5 inch disk or uh, a non-labeled tape. Um, and then up at the top, you can see that they started at one point using email. Um, but initially, it was, it was on BitNet. Um, so this was a, a form of uh, mostly uh, telephone-based communication that was uh, being used, an early adoption of, of, of modems within the university context. And so this was the first time that they ever used something um, that was network-based, and it was called the BitNet. When they transitioned to the internet, though, this document kept being used all the way up till I think, 1997 is the last time that I've seen it before they sort of redid it. They didn't bother to you know, create a whole new form. They just kind of crossed out the bitnet and added an internet and then just photocopied the form. Right? So why bother? You know, there's just going to be another technological revolution. Why should we bother to have a whole new form? Well, OK, so the internet has stuck as our name, but there was no way of knowing that in 1995 that it was going to be the term that we still stuck with over time. And sort of this, this form sort of captures that sensibility. So I mentioned then that uh, mobile became something in cloud. This is something that I've, I've heard them exploring a little bit today. And that was part of the way that I got involved in this project. So I'm going to give you a sense of now, how did I get involved in the Mac? And that'll give you a sense of how does this thing operate as an infrastructure. Um, so they approached me. Um, I was at Georgetown. There's one of the sites is at Georgetown University. They approached me with a concern or a question about the ways in which HIV AIDS was being changed by the appearance of new uh, compu computer media communication, like mobile or like the internet. They wanted to understand what was changing in this 30-year arc of history. So these two threads that I've put here, of one of a scientific history and one of a technological his history, are actually not independent. Right? They're the, the ways in which people communicate who are either HIV positive or at risk of being HIV positive is itself affected by the technological means of communication. And that's what they asked me to investigate. So let me switch from just a general topic of, H of, of AIDS to HIV and mobile. This is the research project that me and my collaborators initially engaged in, and this is what got me involved in the MAX. Um, so what happens? How does this thing called the kernel work? All right, so whenever I began this project, they were able to give me a series of, um, a series of, of men from the cohort that I could begin interviewing. I'm a qualitative researcher, so I insisted the first thing I needed to do was do focus groups and interviews. And I didn't actually have to go out and recruit these men. They have this base of several hundred men within Baltimore that you can draw from and say, hey, w are you interested in participating in this study? So I didn't have to go out and recruit them. And then I ran these focus groups. They were enormously, the, the, the practitioners here in uh, the experts and the retention experts were excellent in helping me think about the ways in which I would have to uh, pay some of these men or give them a, some sort of reward or some sort of benefit for participating in the study and also for managing the IRB process. So I didn't have to sort of learn a biomedical system of IRB. There were people there who helped me navigate that since it's not my particular expertise. So I ran my focus groups and then uh, me and my team developed a questionnaire. Not a very long one, 15 questions based on, 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 on questions around HIV and, and use of mobile or internet technologies to communicate. And then what we were able to do is add this questionnaire to the existing stream of activities. So every, every six months, they come in again and fill in new forms. So this questionnaire was just added to that visit. Rather than having to go and recruit an entire set of people and sort of set it up and, and find a place to do it, it was just added to an existing set of activities. I didn't have to do much of that work. And then, of course, that questionnaire produced data, went into their archive, and it's there to be reused by anyone who wants it. What was really interesting for me, though, is that I got a lot more data than just the questionnaire. Questionnaire just had 15 questions on, on activities of use of the, of the internet and so on. Um, what they were able to provide me was an entire database that they'd, you know, well-described men is the way that they like to characterize the cohort. That is that there's a lot of information about them. They have also demographic information, information about what medications they're taking, their adherence of those medications, and so on. And so I was able to ask 15 questions but actually get a whole lot more data. I didn't have to put together an enormous survey with all the sort of what are your activities daily or what are your understandings of this or that. They had that kind of data. I only needed to get a little more, and I got quite a bit more from the database. So in this sense, it was interesting for me to operate in this organization because I never actually had to sort of go out into the world. Right? I never had to go out and recruit people. I never had to go and uh, deal with IRB and ethical questions, although I did at some level. 
but not deeply because there were people there to help me do this. Um, and I didn't have to collect a whole bunch of extra data and do this very long form because the data was already available to be added to what I already knew. So in this sense, it was an infrastructure and in that I didn't have to do, it's not that I'm saying it was easy or a breeze. There was a lot of paperwork and a lot of things that I had to do, but I never at any point had to sort of start from scratch. In this sense, it's an infrastructure. It supported my research and made it a lot easier and faster to do. Okay. So what have we explained so far? What do we know now? So the kernel of a research infrastructure does this. It, it gives us the analytical leverage to explain how an infrastructure adapts to changing objects of investigation. This is what I've done. I've taken the same analysis that I just did of myself for you and traversed it across this entire history. How have those four resources made it possible for the Max to support objects of investigation that are changing over time, including shifting from looking for the cause to knowing that it's HIV, which is a very dramatic transformation, right? All of a sudden, you're reorganized completely. But the other transformations were just as dramatic as well, from a fatal disease to a chronic disease, is able to adapt. And I've explained these in other publications. I won't get into it today. But similarly to what I've done in this uh, sort of explaining of my own um, experience with the Max. So how infrastructure adapts to changing objects of investigation. The second thing that it, it sort of surprised me as I built up this analytical concept, it helped me understand how infrastructure will support the investigation of certain objects while making other objects altogether impossible. So this, this was a surprise. I hadn't expected this. Do you want to guess? Here's another way of representing the kernel and the things that are in it. Do you want to guess what the max does not make possible to investigate? Anyone? When you say make possible, do you mean physical capacity or do you mean able to do it? Uh, it uh, it's sort of the intersection of both in some ways, but um, epistemologically, it cannot produce in knowledge about certain kinds of populations, and they refuse, not refuse, but have chosen not to move in certain directions. And you'll see why in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So heterosexual transmission is something that cannot be investigated, right? So it's gay and bisexual men, and there are no self-identified heterosexual men in this population. Women in HIV, even more challenging, right? There are no women in this cohort. There's 5,000 men, and so there's no way of studying this disease specific to women in HIV. And they're all North American. Um, it's a North American cohort study. They're in four American cities, and so understanding the diversity of the ways in which HIV affects people globally is not something that the Max can do. It can generalize. It can say, we expect other populations to be similar, but they cannot study the specific issues related to HIV and women, for example. So let's dig in here. Uh, let's dig into this topic of women and HIV. So. Um, I'm only going to be able to give, yet again, a very potted history of um, the sense of women and HIV during the late 1980s that led to a, the formation of a second infrastructure. I'm going to traverse this history very quickly, but there's a lot of detail in here. So by 1988, we already knew that the fastest growing population with HIV was women. So very early in the epidemic, we already knew that this was going to be an area that was going to be, um, that needed a lot more research. Um, by 1991, 6.7% of AIDS clinical trial group participants were women. So in 1991, even as we know by 1998 that the fastest growing population of women, uh, of, of, of people with HIV are women, in 1991, the clinical trials, which are where you do tests for new drugs, tests for treatments, only 6.7% of those people were women. And um, Paula, this led um, critical scholar Paula Treichler to argue and declare that AIDS science is founded upon the study of men's bodies. Um, what, again, I have to summarize this, but what ended up happening is a multi-pronged coalition that formed during the early 90s of different kinds of activists who tried to transform this research landscape. So women's groups or feminist groups came together. Um, here's a quote that, um, that is recorded by Steve Epstein in his excellent book, um, Inclusion. We are not your incubators. It is not that there was no research done on women. There was research done on women, but it was very particular what kinds of focuses science decided to have. One of the focuses that was developed was women and the uh, transmission of HIV to infants. There was, a, there was quite a few studies done in the, in the domain of transmission to infants. And so these women were protesting and saying, okay, that's all very well, that's great that we have this, but we also, we as women also deserve to have some research done on us as women, not just as incubators, right? 
AIDS activists, a very interesting story of AIDS activists throughout the, uh, throughout the 80s and 1990s, um, sort of a two-pronged effort. On the one hand, they um, mobilized popular activities, uh, popular protests on the streets and so on, but they also um, intervened in the medical sphere as well. There's a really interesting story to be told about the ways AIDS, AIDS activists learned the science and got into the science and intervened there directly. And then lastly, scientists and doctors with this kind of data that I showed you about how many people are involved in cl clinical trials and who are the new growing populations at risk of HIV, they themselves um, mobilize studies and evidence and mobilize uh, institutions of science to transform the ways that research were done. So this all sort of culminated in what uh, Steve Epstein has called uh, an inclusion in and difference paradigm, or the NIH Revitalization Act is another way of putting it. In 1993, new mandates in NIH demanded the diversity of um, women, people of color, people of different ages as well within biomedical research studies. So now it's essentially by law that this has to be done. And one of the outcomes was the development of the, the Women's Interagency HIV Study. So a, a similar study to the MAX, but particularly focused on women. So if I draw out for you the kernel, I'll, I'll, I'll draw out for you the similarities in a minute, but the most important feature of the kernel then is that it's, um, instead of having those 5,000 men in later cohorts, it is, it is based on a study of 2,600 women in six sites across the US, and then it grew later to 10 sites and more um, people over time. Um, so with this, project, it, again, it allows us to understand the ways in which a particular infrastructure enables the study of certain kinds of objects. With this infrastructure, we can now study treatment effectiveness in women, uh, breast and cervical cancers, menopause and HIV, aging with HIV, and all the sort of ways in which a HIV manifests specifically in women. But what's most interesting and what I want to draw your attention to is, is even I'm, I'm drawing these two kernels in the same way. Um, partially because I'm interested in, 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 in drawing them in that way, right? So I'm, I'm analyzing through the kernel. But really, they have exactly the same four resources. And the reason for that is because one was based on the other. The Ys was explicitly based on the model that had been developed for the Max. They explicitly drew on all four of the ways in which the Max was done for the purposes of comparability. So diverse experts, some of the same uh, scientists or team members are involved in both of the projects many of the same instruments are used in both of the studies. So here's an example. Here's uh, on the left, you have the MAX uh, instrument for depression. And on the right, you have the WISE instrument for depression. Yeah, I don't think you can see from uh, the sides of the screen, but they're exactly the same 20 questions. It's exactly the same 20 questions are asked of both the women and the men. Um, it's kind of good that you can't see this in too much detail. This is the sexual behavioral questionnaire. It gets pretty explicit. It gets a little PG-14. Um, but this is uh, obviously in, 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 in understanding HIV AIDS transmission. It's important to understand sexual behaviors. They ask very detailed questions about sexual activities. Where they can, the questions are exactly the same. So in, in the things that are, that are exactly the same between men who have sex with men or m women who have sex with men or women who have sex with women, then they ask exactly the same set of questions. Obviously, some of the sexual practices amongst those populations will be different, and so there are specific questions that are going to be different. But even when the questions are different, they tried to phrase them in ways to render the data comparable that would be produced. So the instruments themselves are very similar across the studies. I just showed you the questionnaires, but also many of the scientific assays, the biomedical assays that they use, are exactly the same brand, um, exactly calibrated in exactly the same way, using the same protocols. Um, and this all produces highly comparable data and specimens, which was really their goal. So this diagram here shows the, there, uh, there's been 32, I believe, studies that have been done in collaboration between the MAX and the WISE. So bringing these two organizations together so that they can study even more things. Um, the most average, uh, it, basically the way this, this diagram works is that the thickness of the lines represents how many times they've studied something. So the most commonly studied objects between the MAX and the Ys are uh, heart in particular, which is also the treatment, the cocktail. So uh, HIV, dif uh, HIV disease differences in men and women, treatment differences, and, and hazard of death differences are just some three examples of things that they've studied together, comparing the ways in which HIV affects men versus women. The only way this is possible then, given these two architectures that I showed you, the MAX can't produce this on its own, the WISE can't produce this on its own, only together can they produce this kind of finding com comparisons across men and women. So the kernel then, we've, we've got two things that we understand 
so far, the, how it enables certain kinds of objects, disables certain other kinds of objects, and now we also understand how through collaboration and coordination we can study more. How it's possible, we, so this is sort of a common reference point in big data. Big data often says, we can study more things. Okay, well, this is a ways in which I can show that this is actually true in some sense, that it is possible by pulling together different kinds of organizations to study new kinds of objects that wouldn't have been possible individually. Um, I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but it's never, we never get to the point where you can study everything. You can ask me about that um, in the question and answer period if you're interested. Um, the third thing that the kernel allowed me to do is to do <coughs> excuse me, a broader ecological analysis of, of, of infrastructure. This is where we're going to get into the third infrastructure that I was pointing to, the NA Accord, which is the North American AIDS Cohort Collaboration and on Research and Design. It's built on, they don't use this language, uh, this is not typically the language of biomedicine, but it is built on a model that seemed very familiar to me with my, from my studies in the sciences of e-science, big data, or cyber infrastructure, which were the language that were particularly used today and developed throughout the 2000s. Um, so here's a quote from the NA Accord so you know what it does. The goal of the NA Accord is to establish a collaboration of North American HIV AIDS cohorts to address HIV AIDS research questions that cannot be accomplished through smaller cohorts. And when they say smaller cohorts, they, they mean things like the MACs and the Ys, which are actually very large cohorts, but they have 25 different projects that they pull together. So what I've done in this talk, you've already been introduced to the MACs, founded in 1983 and continuing to the present. And you know about the Ys, founded in 1994, continuing to the present. What I haven't really drawn out for you is that there's an entire ecology of these. There's many of these cohort studies in HIV AIDS science. So there's also ALIVE, which focuses on intravenous drug users, uh, the San Francisco Men's Health Study, which focuses on, on heterosexual populations, um, a hepatitis B cohort that was started in the 1970s for studying hepatitis B, but was repurposed for the study of HIV AIDS during the, during, the, uh, during the 1980s, and many, many more. And so this is what I'm calling the ecology of infrastructures. There's many of these projects running today or that in the past have run that have, have been there to support studies of HIV AIDS science. And they, they themselves know this. So these people who developed the NA Accord s also know this and probably know it better than I do at this point since this is sort of the end point of my research right now. They themselves identify that these exist and sought to pull them together in one umbrella project. So let me just read you a quote from Tony Hayes' definition of e-science or cyber infrastructure. Um, Tony Hayes, uh, sort of a, a leading figure in e-science. Um, he was, I think, a vice president uh, at Microsoft until recently. So one of the key goals of e-science or cyber infrastructure is interoperable scientific data. We want to access information from different sites to integrate, federate, and analyze information from many disparate and distributed data sources. They want the ability to search, access, move, manipulate, and mine such data will be central will be a central requirement for this new generation of collaborative science software applications. Right? So those are the things that they desire out of this new generation of infrastructure projects. So the NA Accord pulls these cohorts together. These are all the uh, different sites that they draw data from. Max has four and the Ys has ten. So the rest of them are from other cohorts. And this is uh, sort of my beginning analysis of what I've found by, lo by looking at the NA Accord. Don't think this is a network diagram, but it's not a formal network diagram. This is sort of an ethnographic tool that I use to make sense of the thing that I'm investigating. What you'll see, so what does this mean? What are these, these horrendous diagrams? You never know what they mean, right? Um, or, or they're beautiful diagrams, but they're confusing. D running down the middle are all the cohorts. Here's the 25 cohorts that the NA Accord pulls data from. Um, you'll see the Ys at the top that you know about and the Macs over there. It's organized in terms of how many times each one of these has contributed data to a study. So each one of the, uh, ob the, the, the listed objects on the left and the right are studies that have been done through the NA Accord. Things like bio studies of biomarkers or risk regression models for ep epidemiology or studies of anal cancer. So each time that one of these cohorts has contributed data to the study of one of these objects, there's a line connecting them. Right? So this diagram then tells you what does it take to study one of these particular objects of study and how is it that it, which, which ones of the cohorts are it, is it drawing from. The last thing that you'll note, I, I mentioned that it's, it's hierarchically organized in terms of how many times they've contributed. You'll see that the Ys is at the top. The Ys has contributed the most to these uh, sort of collective studies of HIV AIDS. Do you want to guess why? That's right. 
Um, there are, many of the other cohorts do have women in them, but the WISE has the largest, most representative sample of women, and so they often need to draw on the resources of the WISE. So what I want you to understand and think about then is each, I don't want you to think of each one of these as somewhere that they're getting data from. What I've tried to give you a sense of as I've gone through this 30 year story of the Max and a little bit of the Ys is that these aren't just data sources, right? These are actually the lives, uh, the careers of people for the last 30 years. Each one of them represents an enormous investment of mostly the career of an entire person. Also the careers of these data managers, programmers, and the men themselves, men and women, who've contributed their bodies and time uh, to these studies. So each one of them represents a form of life, um, is so, sort of a paraphrasing what Wittgenstein might have said. Um, and I just want to, so to illustrate that for you, I want to just conclude with uh, drawing your attention back to a question that came from the Max. Um, can you read that? Okay, I'll read it for you. So this is a question that's on the sexual, question, uh, se sexual questionnaire um, from the Max, one that's been asked right since 1984, since they began, since they began doing the, the visits. You engaged in deep, wet kissing where one of you put your mouth into the other's mouth. And you have the ability to say yes or no that you've engaged in that practice, and then you can say how many times, up to 999 times in the last six months, right? Not a bad life, right? Um, they still ask this question today. So 30 years la later, they're still asking this question. And yet we don't think today that there's any association, any, any high level, any meaningful risk in deep kissing uh, uh, in terms of the transmission of HIV AIDS. Right? The question was initially there because they didn't know, but it remains there today, so why? People ask this all the time, apparently. These men who have to come in once every six months and fill out the questionnaires ask and say of their interviewee, why are you making me answer this question? And this is a quote that I found from one of the protocols in the Max. This is how the interviewers are trained to answer if anyone asks, why are you still asking me this question? If anyone asks why we include deep kissing in this survey, please reply with the following answer. When the Max was started, that was the definition adopted for sexual activity, as we really don't know how, didn't know how HIV was transmitted, or even that it was HIV, and wanted to cover all our potential, all potential routes. But nowadays, it probably stays in there only because of a desire not to change definitions of something as basic as sex in midstream. So in other words, they keep it there primarily because if they'd remove that question, the entire architecture of how they'd define sexual activity for the entire study would have to be changed and it would present a lot of statistical problems in terms of how they actually analyze and collate their data. They wouldn't have this data point anymore. So I just wanted to draw your attention. So the MAX was founded for the purpose of investigating its cause. And this question was put there in order, because they didn't know maybe deep kissing was involved in transmission. It isn't. And yet, the question still remains. The history of this question of what is the cause of AIDS remains inscribed in this infrastructure. So to conclude, a socio-technical history of the present, what do I actually mean by that? Well, um, data and resource integration has occurred over time. The story that I've told you is of three phases of data and resource integration, but each one of those phases stays with us in the present. So the MAX, when it was founded, I showed you this entire layer. The entire time that it's been running, it's been trying to make its resources comparable by standardizing its instruments, by asking the same questions over time, by uh, calibrating its, uh, by, by, by making its data interoperable as well. But we've also seen how the WISE was sort of built upon the architecture of the MAX. Another effort to create integration, they were built upon each other so that there could be comparable data across these two different organizations so that you could produce new kinds of findings that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And then the third story I've told you is of the NAI Accord, this more new, this new recent uh, contemporary approach to data integration where many cohorts are brought together, but none of the history of these previous organizations sort of disappears with that. They still have to work with the data that are collected with these organizations. So each infrastructure is inscribed with its socio-technical history. And when I say inscribed, it's, it's not a very uh, metaphorical view. As you saw with this question, the question of deep kissing was there in 1984 and it remains there. And so it's quite a literal inscription in some sense. But it's inscribed with its politics and culture. Each one of these organizations was born at its own particular time. The Max was born at a time when we didn't understand what the cause of AIDS was and, and, and sort of a sense of crisis and, and a mounting epidemic. The WISE was formed at a moment of understanding that there were not enough studies being done of women, and yet that, that was the sort of mounting concern within biomedical circles. And today, NA Accord is founded in a political moment or a, 
cultural moment in which we're really interested in integration and drawing together um, these views, these big data views. Um, similarly, the socio-technical organization of each one of these organizations has persisted over time. And the, the very objects, the very things that they, they were interested in studying over time is inscribed in each one of these infrastructures, right? So the, the cause remains in the max. Women uh, and, and as, as an issue, women in HIV remains as an issue for the max, uh, for the wise, sorry. If I have a design and policy takeaway, and this is the kind of thing that, I, that when I speak to people at NSF who are going to build new projects like this, my, pro my, my sort of argument for them is that rather than seeing these, these new big data projects, there's often this sense of clearance, that we're going to build something anew, that we're going to have a new clean data interoperability system and support the sciences and using the newest technologies. And this is not what I've found in my research. What I've found instead is that we've got historically stacked integration efforts rather than clearance, that we build on one on top of the other. And we actually have to live with the consequences of the decisions that we made 30 years ago in these projects. They don't just disappear away, even with the newest sort of technological resources that we deploy in today's projects. Thanks. <clears throat>